Hello and welcome to Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. I'm Becky Parker Geist and I'm your host. Audiobook Connection is your place to learn about the audiobook creative process in discussions between the authors, narrators, producers, and post production teams that bring them all together, as well as guests who have listened to the audiobooks and have questions for the creative teams. This podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I have with me Julian Blackmore, who is a British composer and musician now based in New York. He's been involved in music and audio for the past 25 years, from playing in sketchy venues to rocking out stadiums, from recording sessions on two-inch tape to producing audiobooks in Pro Tools scoring student films to placements on the BBC and working with the Metropolitan Opera. His music has been in theater and media productions around the globe, including India, Hong Kong, South Africa, Australia, and Dubai. If you watch enough unscripted telly, you've probably inadvertently heard his work. Before relocating to New York to study musical theater writing, Julian toured internationally with top UK tribute band ABBA Forever and with 70s crooners Smokey. He played keyboards, sang, and hosted for the world-famous Café Wa band in Greenwich Village, New York City, for eight years before the pandemic struck and forced him to put his skinny jeans into storage. His rescue dog, Parsley, tends to supervise a lot of his work. Julian, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So let's start at the very beginning. Seems like a very good place to start. When did you start writing music, if you can remember when that was? That's so long ago, right? Uh, Yeah. (laughs) I think I started very, very young. I have this memory of we had a piano at home and my two siblings who are like seven, eight years older than me had music lessons. And I I have this memory of like noodling around on the piano. There's this old Dutch cop. TV show that Vander Vander Dam or something like that, but it was like it had a very kind of rocking theme tune. I remember like plunking it out, and although that was like copying someone else's music, it was like just something that inspired me, like plunking it out. And I think I started kind of noodling around on the piano before I had enrolled me in piano lessons, and I was more interested in what I could create on the piano rather than practicing what I should have been practicing. So I would say kind of a, a very early, like around six maybe i started piano when i was seven so probably yeah. a year or two before sort of rebellion inspired it sounds like uh, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that said the <laughs> piano lessons were very useful in terms of like harmony and, and the kind of traditional training which allows you then to know what rules you want to break so yeah did you study other musical instruments as a kid i did not for a while so i started piano when I was at seven and then when i went to was then senior school, which was, would I guess be combo, yeah, middle and then high school. The music department, we had a really good music teacher there who was like, had ran a handball team and he had different, he had an orchestra and like a, a band, which was more kind of brass and wind instruments. So I started learning, I started on cornet there and then I moved to uh, euphonium and then I had a brief stint on clarinet and decided that was uh, a bad idea and saxophone was just way more interesting <laughs> to play. And then I think saxophone was the last instrument I played mm-hmm. for that band. And then I was also on the handbell team as well, which is, uh, that was different. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, I did play a few other instruments, not necessary to any great skill. Piano was always my kind of first thing. Did you find that as you were learning the different instruments, was that sort of that desire to come up with your own tunes? Was that growing as well through your youth? For sure, yeah. I I guess I really got more into writing stuff as I was kind of entering my tweenies and my teenage years. And it was more songwriting, but I was definitely like... And also at that stage, at that school, great music teacher, he let me take keyboards home like for the summer. And they had the Yamaha, I think it was the Yamaha PRS 61, which is like, look, it's a terrible keyboard, really. It's not like a pro keyboard, but it was one of those home (laughs) keyboards that did auto chords and had rhythms and stuff. And I took it home 
they had one and I, he let me borrow it for the whole summer. And that was just, I think that was just someone else. So I was like, oh, wow, I can do all this. And like, I used to do like home album albums uh, in air yeah. quotes um, on cassette tape and literally just like have my like ghetto blaster keyboard playing. And it was just like recording the output of the speaker into the microphone. It wasn't even like a direct input, but recorded like a whole yeah, album. Yeah. Of, of, I say album, like 30, 40 minutes of material over that time. So that was definitely when I was like, oh, I can create stuff. And it's what I thought was really cool. Yeah. I think yeah. a friend of mine yeah. in London still has one or two of those albums. He's threatening to make them available <laughs> to the highest bidder, but no one's come forward. Oh, I- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's great. A great teacher in any subject can make just such a huge difference. Yeah. He- and our choices, our confidence. Yeah. And he was, he was just great school wide. He, he, like, he just ran and it was probably beyond the purview of his job, like all the kind of extracurricular activities he did. And, but he was just committed to doing it. There were so many people involved in the different kind of ensembles that he had. And the handball team was yeah. actually, they won, it was called New Faces. It was the, you know, what the X Factor would have been in the 70s. So this is before I was involved, but they won yeah. like the X Factor of the 70s in the UK. They were that, you know. Hot uh-huh. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I have to just share this because I was, when you said you did those albums, those early <laughs> albums, it reminded me so much. When I was a kid, a friend of and I had a reel to reel tape recorder mm-hmm. and we decided we were going to create. So we created a whole radio show. We did advertisements, uh, commercials, and um, all kinds of different shows right. on this. Very fun, very fun stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so as you were getting older, you know, in your teenage and then moving beyond that, did you have a feeling that you were going to, that music was going to become your, that you were going to be a musician? Funnily (laughs) enough, no, until, so in the UK, the the school system is, the last years of of senior school, it's, you do your GCSEs and that's when you, you choose some like maths and science are compulsory and then you choose like three subjects that you want to do like geography or, or French or whatever and then choose to go on to do further education at A-levels and then that leads on to university level so I guess the A-levels would be the equivalent of high school anyway going back to your original question so I was at the point I guess it was like 13 14 of like choosing which subjects to do for GCSE and I had a natural kind of ability or I had some kind of talent with French. And I was like, well, I assume like I'll do French and geography because I'm good at those. Mm -hmm. Why would I do music? Or I I couldn't choose music because it just the timetable didn't work. I had to choose one or the other. And French was obviously Mm -hmm. the sensible option because you can get a proper job at the UN or whatever. And um, the school were like, and again, the music teacher, Mr. White, let's give him the name. Mr. White was like, but he should do music because he's really good at it. And it was like this whole thing. So the school were like, okay, what he'll do is he'll, one afternoon of French, he'll skip and go to the music class. And then, because he can handle that, and then he can also handle missing all the music class lessons because he's having private lessons, playing the piano. And, you know, so they, they wangled it so I could do an extra GCSE. This is super tangential, but it, we'll get to it. We'll get, there is a point behind it. <laughs> no, oh, this is great. <laughs> this is great. And, and good to know also that Mr. White stepped in in that that critical moment too. Yeah. He said, yeah, perhaps my parents did. I don't know. They were on the PTA, so they may have had some kind of like, well, that's super unfair that you can't do both because of just mm-hmm. the time temperature. Anyway, GCSEs, they're not, they were a new thing at the time and, and they're more partially exam based, but there was a lot of practical coursework. So they'd have, towards the end of the, the two years, they'd have a moderator come in to look at the coursework that you'd done and to kind of just make sure that n- nothing untoward was going on for the grading. So this guy came in and he was kind of assessing the coursework that we'd done and I was probably playing some of the things I'd written. And he was like, oh, you're not toot my own horn. He was like, oh, you're really good at this. You're going to study at a level. And I was like, no, I was going to do French and sociology mm-hmm. and something else. Yeah. Was, oh, I'm... I hadn't decided, but anyway, French and sociology, maybe German. And the guy was like, oh, no, you should really, like, study this more. And up until that point, it always just been something I did and something I was kind of good at without yeah. thinking about it. And then this guy was like, no, you should really, like, study at A-level. You should do it at university. And until that point, I'd never thought I would do that. It wasn't hadn't entered my mind of, like, yes, it was cool to do. 
yeah. just like, you know, running around the park is cool to do. Right, so at that yeah. point, when the guy said, oh, no, you should study it, that's, you know, if I was going to point to one time in my life when, you know, everything changed. Yeah. <laughs> For the better or not, <laughs> who knows? But it was that point where he was like, you know, it's a sliding doors thing. If he hadn't said that thing or he hadn't come in that day or it was a day when I wasn't in the classroom, done something completely different. But he, right. you know, started me on that direction, which then I went on to do music at A-level, which is prior to going to university. Then I studied music at university and yeah. So Yeah. Well, we're glad that, <laughs> you know, that he showed up that day. That was, uh, that was good. Yeah. <laughs> so was there a moment when... It was like, do you remember when you got your first like professional gig as a musician and what that was? Were you, that is hard. Were you performing more initially or were you composing more? For sure performing more. It was, that stuff came back to me really easily. I think it would have been a performing gig mm -hmm. because I think at the time I was more like, I'm going to write songs and be, yeah, that stuff. Just like everyone else did so <laughs> yeah. like I went through university writing even though I, I studied composition it was still like but I'm writing songs mm -hmm. so my very first professional gig would have been yeah it would have been at some like working men's club in Yorkshire like so I, when I yeah. graduated from university another pivotal moment and this may, may have not been the best choice but anyway I had I was kind of like figuring out what to do and I had an offer of going down to London to I guess apprentice with a guy who wrote music for TV. He did a lot of like cooking show stuff and he was looking for someone to, and this was in the days before email and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So he'd like ring the house phone on this shared house where I was there. It, it was, I don't know how he got in touch with me. Anyway, he offered me that job, but then I also had an offer to work for a band who had a record deal in Denmark. So it was like, I'm going to do that because rock and roll is cool. So the very first gig would have been at a working men's club, you know, when I got uh -huh. cash for my musical knowledge was that. All right, yeah. And and were you on keyboard at that point? Keyboard, yeah. What, is that what you were playing? Yeah. So, and, and just because, you know, clearly you have been performing or were performing up until the pandemic hit, I've, have you been able to get out there and perform again yet? Or uh, I did. I have done a few. So the pandemic hit and no one knew what was going on. And the club where, where I was working was like trying to figure out ways they could make money. So I did a few shows, we did some outdoor stuff, and then they slowly opened up the club with, like a smaller band and like less people in. So I did several of those. And then in the following May, so it was May 2021, my wife and I bought a house upstate. So we, we left. So I did my my farewell gig at Cafe Wa, got home at like four in the morning and then was up again at 5.30, ready for the movers. So that was a ridiculous moving day. Yeah. Uh, and I have gone back <laughs> to the city since then and done a few, a few gigs for them. Mm -hmm. But really, yeah, the pandemic was kind of the end of the performing side and it, uh, for, it was good i was ready to those late nights were, mm -hmm. were killing me and i was ready to just sit and move boxes around a screen and say it's music <laughs> <laughs> that's what i do great uh, we're going to take just a short pause we'll come right back do you have a book that you imagine with multiple voices or a screenplay or stage play at pro audio voices we love working on these more complex productions with music and sound effects and a full cast of voices. Bringing together decades of experience in both theatre and audio production, our team brings your project to life. From manuscript preparation, to casting, to directing the actors, and a post-production team to bring it all together, Pro Audio Voices brings your project to life. Learn more at ProAudioVoices.com forward slash full dash cast. And we're back. Let's talk a little bit about composing music mm -hmm. and for different kinds of, in different kinds of contexts. Like I know you compose music for theater and for audiobooks and for podcasts. And so I thought maybe we, we could dive just a little bit into what you, from your perspective, like what are some of those differences in the composing experience on those different avenues? So let's start off with theater compared to either of the the audio only experiences mm -hmm. of audiobooks or podcasts. Well, they're similar in that they're all storytelling, even on interview based podcasts, because there is some kind of story, some kind of narrative going on. Right. But with theater, it's 
you're writing songs. So I'm talking about musical theatre writing rather than writing underscores right. for plays, but even that's still storytelling. So with musical theatre, it's like you're writing songs for singers to sing, but it's still performing the same function as music in a podcast or an audio book would do in that they're supporting the drama and everything should support the story that's happening. Right. And then another big difference is like you're writing for theatre, it's, it's going to constantly be changing. You'll do a first draft of the show, you'll realise that actually it should open this way and things will change and it's a much longer process and there's like more creative voices in the room. There's, aside from you and your collaborators, there's the director and then there's all the sound designer will come in you know, further down the line when you're in production stage. And there's so many different aspects of the storytelling that the music is is just one thing that will fit in and then the orchestrations will come in. So it's a long, a long process. Scoring a podcast or an audio book, like you're producing everything yourself. So, and it's it's a finished mm-hmm. product. Like when once it's done, it's done. Once a, once a music, piece right. of music theatre has been produced, the next time it's produced, there could be some changes to it. So it's constantly evolving. Yeah. As well as the fact that you're writing songs as opposed to doing underscore. Right, yeah. Would you find that there's much difference from your perspective between creating intros, outros, that kind of music for podcasts versus music that's for audiobooks? Yeah, because intros and outros, and similar to commercials as well, have to kind of get to the point much quicker. And even though, yes, there's still a story to tell, it's like you're doing the the Cliff Notes version of the story in an intro. You're like, Mm -hmm. there you go. And you want to get to the point and get in and out super quick. And yeah. also with intros, it's more grabbing the attention. And whereas when you're scoring like an audio book, you don't want to grab the attention. You want to just support what's happening. So there's right. the similarity is that, yes, you're telling a story, but the, the how you're telling the story and your role in that is, is mm-hmm. different. Yeah, I like the way you put that. that I like that the role, the role of the music and the story. Yeah. A, is, is, is slightly different. That's cool. Let's get into the weeds a little bit. Let's talk about your process. Oh, man. Let's talk about your process when creating music for an audio book, because that's our, our primary mm-hmm. interest here. Certainly we podcast as well, but let's talk about audiobooks. Where do you want to begin or where do you begin? What's the beginning for you? It's always good to for anything, but also with audiobooks, it's always good to have some kind of like know what the author or the producer wants or who the intended audience is for, what they're trying to say. Like you want, you want to know that what's going on in their mind. Right. So find out what the overall message of the book is or the story is. And it's always good to have references. Like what do they imagine it sounding like? Because, and also it's a communication as, thing as well because while most people would say a major chord is happy and a minor chord is sad on a, on a very bass level like music is so subtle yeah. that someone might find one piece of music uplifting and someone might find it a, a slightly different emotion so you want to make sure that they might say we want it to be tense but your definition of tense may be different from their definition of tense so the references are good to have so that you can be clear on how the your person you're collaborating with understands music or what it, how it speaks to them so that yeah. you're sad and that. And you want maybe define references a little bit more for our audience. Yeah, just yeah. samples of music and it can be songs or soundtracks or just any piece of music that speaks to them. So if they can send a piece of music saying, this is how I imagine this scene, the music behind this scene going, or they might say, this is what I think is sad music. Or I want this kind of vibe if they want like mm. a, a specific genre or, or sound or specific instruments. Right. And even that's great because some people may have like musical knowledge where they can say, I want the sound of a trumpet and they actually mean a trumpet, but some people don't and some people just are mistaken. So they might say, I want a xylophone and they actually mean a glockenspiel, which has happened before because they have two yeah. very different ones, comedy and ones can be spooky so it, it references uh, just any mm. kind of samples of music that already exist that you can help that can help clarify communication right 
Okay, so then it sounds like one of the best things that an author can do to prepare to work with a composer if they're considering that for an audiobook would be to have some other existing music that they feel like is the either like the vibe or the style or the instrumentation or the feel, you know, whatever, something that would help you to understand what they're going after. Exactly. Yeah. Like uh, ideally a Spotify playlist that they can put together and then maybe documents go without saying like, I like these instruments or I like this sound, even if it's not necessarily the right mood or emotion for the book, they might say, I really like the French horn in this or, or whatever. So yeah, mm -hmm. some kind of playlist and if necessary, a document that kind of also clarifies what they like about each thing. I like mm -hmm. how this changes at this point. And that can give you an, a clue as to like what drives or what the author's going for and what how the author hears things, because it can be different to how yeah. you as a composer right. hears things. Yeah, that makes sense because, because music is a different language. Mm -hmm. So it's, we're really, it sounds like what you're describing here is sort of this, the translation process, how we understand each other in the language of music, because English or any other language is only going to give us words, whereas it that doesn't translate directly. Exactly, yeah. So, and it's so subjective yeah. that um, it's much better to have yeah. someone say, I want something, and I want it to sound this emotion and his piece of music that does that for me. Then you like kind of get an insight mm -hmm. into like what, what works for them. Right, so, yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's say now you have this, and then, so you have these references. What's the next step for you? Next step would be a technical term called noodling, where you no noodle around, <laughs> as I, no, like I did when I was sick. Noodle around just to come up with some kind of thematic ideas based on the references. So, so you can maybe have an idea of the instrumentation or if it's a particular genre, then you've got that. But just noodling around to get some thematic ideas out of the way and kind of ideally sketch that on paper so that you can see them straight away. It's all very well noodling on your inside logic or whatever and you record it but if you can see it it's then much easier to then develop those ideas so the next step mm. would be to get some kind of thematic ideas so you've got some kind of organic matter that you can develop over the course uh -huh. of the book which is what i did in in the case of this book that i'm working on currently is like noodled around on the first track and that became the thematic idea for the rest of rest of the music yeah, great. All right. And just to give a shout out, we're far from being, you know, done with this audiobook, but we are working on uh, Joseph Durrett's book, um, Fight or Flight, A South Side Story. And that's, uh, so I wanted to uh, give a shout out about that. Okay. So then you do this noodling, you've got some ideas. And then what's the next step? The next step is, well, then that's when it's a case of like, what, you know, what's this scene what are we doing in this scene what role is music playing in the scene is it directing are, are we preempting what's about to happen are we doing subtext against the dialogue or are we like is it just like if it's an action scene it's like are we just like making it even more tense and then building right, out yeah. a cue based on you know use your thematic ideas and build out a cue based on you know whatever scene whatever it is you're trying to do in that scene Right. And then, of course, you know, one of the other steps that's happening while you're working on that is the recording of the narration is coming mm -hmm. together so that then once you have your music and you have the narration together, I mean, I know the answer <laughs> to this, but then are you going to do some <laughs> adjusting of either music or narration to make that all work? to its best for sure yeah because there can be points where normally in an audio book you wouldn't want vast amounts of silence but there may be a point after maybe after a particularly dramatic moment where there's music and you just want to leave that thought hanging so the listener can process what's just happened or what's just been said or what's just been revealed right. and obviously in, in a regular audio book you wouldn't have that space but with music you can allow that space to the music can carry on that thought so there may be adjustments to the narration and similarly adjustments to music if it's too long or too short or just some 
fine tuning of bits and pieces so everything lands where it should. Right. And then, so it's um, clearly a very creative process, lots of adjustments that may be happening along the way. So I just want to ask from your perspective, what are some of the hiccups that can happen along the way that it might be helpful for an author who's about to go into this kind of process for the first time it might help them to be aware that sometimes these things can happen. Is there anything that comes to mind in particular about that? I think prepare your reference list so that you're not, you're, you know, if you say hip hop, there could be a billion ways of describing hip hop. So make sure your references are there. But then once you're kind of in the process, I would say be prepared for things to be different when they're recorded as opposed to when it's mm-hmm. on, on the page. Like, it's, you might be reading a chapter and think, oh, this would be this kind of music here. But when, once it's narrated and kind of acted out, the, the pace and the flow of things might be slightly different. So be prepared for things to change. Yeah, and I know that, you know, one of the things that we kind of, we warn against is, like, if you have a recording of the narration in your head, <laughs> yeah. not a recording, but if you have, you know, oh, I know exactly what this character sounds like in your head, to be prepared that it is not going to sound like that, you know, to allow some room for the creative process and room for the the actors to be bringing their gift to the project. So it seems like that would also be a, a good reminder in this music process. Very, yeah, very much the same thing. It's like allow, allow room for things to grow, allow room for what you've created to become what it wants to be. And it, this goes back to right. theatre creation as well. Like you, you write a story and you write the show and then you've got to kind of let it go and let everyone else help. You know, it takes a village to... to yeah build a child whatever the phrase is but you gotta let you know (laughs) let go of your creation because other people will bring there it is and then it's certain my experience right in theater has been like at some point it becomes its own thing and it starts telling you oh no no, this isn't what's happening here this should happen here and similarly like you know you write a book and you've spent however long you've a long time a lot of like blood sweat and tears doing it but at some point you gotta let it go and it can grow and go into the world and that's same yeah. kind of thing. It's like actors will bring something to the role that you may not have imagined. And, you know, if you're having music, then the music will become another voice in the book and to allow yeah. it to do that. I'm reminded as you are talking about that, how it becomes something of its own, that many of us authors talk about, you know, we have an experience of like our characters coming through us rather than like, oh, I have it. I am going to take this lump of clay and I'm going to mold it to exactly the way I want it. But really that there's a lot of the almost more that they already exist or are coming into existence, but we don't have full control. You know, they tell us what they want to say. They decide these things. And I hadn't really thought about it in this exact way before, but it feels a little bit like like that. If we allow the characters to come into Mm -hmm. existence the way they want to come in and say what they want to say, we also kind of need to give them a chance to grow up and not try to hold them so tightly Mm. that that we're trying to fix them into some kind of mold that we have come up with. Yeah, absolutely. That's nail on the head right there. You've got to let things grow <clears throat> like so that was my experience in theater but it's it's all different forms of storytelling like whether it's film theater yeah. or audiobooks or whatever it's you create something and then it becomes its own it has its own energy so yes and then of course you know i mean frozen has whole song so, yeah but, uh, let it go let it go <laughs> let it... <laughs> speaking yeah. of music and letting go yeah that's great. So uh, I feel like you've you've really kind of walked us through the the process of this creation, which has you know the creating music for audiobooks, which is our particular interest. So I just want to thank you again for taking this time with me. And this is again is uh, Julian Blackmore, composer, musician, and we are at Pro Audio Voices. Just so so thrilled to have you as part of our team. Oh, I'm very happy to be on it. And thanks for having me today. It's been uh, 
trip down memory lane. <laughs> oh, there you go. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. As always, if you have questions about uh, this podcast or about getting your own audiobook produced, please reach out to us at proaudiovoices.com. Thanks. Thanks for joining us for Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. Please take a moment to subscribe at audiobookconnection.com. The podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Learn more at proaudiovoices.com. Again, thanks for being with us, and please join us next week.